Um, my name is Spencer Marshman, I write for Retro Fusion magazine, but obviously you're not here for me today. We are very privileged today to have an exceptional... <laughs> what? Well, I'm talking about Archie, aren't you? No, no, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> That's got you, isn't it? It has a little, yeah, I won't lie to you. Okay, we'll skip that formality. Everyone, can you put your hands together, please, for the former MD of Bitmap Brothers, Mike Montgomery. Mike, I just want to say thank you very much for turning up here today. Uh, it's been a real privilege to interview you. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the Bitman Brothers, it all really started with uh, Speedball, didn't it, if I remember correctly? Uh, Zenum. Zenum. Apologies, yeah. And then you moved on to Speedball after that, didn't you? Um, so, I, I heard a rumour that uh, the original Speedball was written on the back of a fag packet, is that true? <laughs> yeah, actually, that is totally true. Um, can people are here? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really great talking to yourself here. Uh, yeah, um, after we had actually done Xenon for um, coming from Master Trunk, which are actually still with Hubshire, still going, um, they, uh, they, kept, they uh, asked us to actually write a game based on your tennis. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what real tennis is, but um, it's played by Prince Charles and there's a court, a Hampton Court, uh, and basically uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite funny, I can't remember it all now, but it's, it's, it's quite similar to squash in some way, but you can score by going through holes in the, in the background and stuff like that, and there's a gallery where you can the ball to go around. So we did quite a lot of research into this uh, real tennis to see you know, how we can make a game out of it, and we came up with spec. And, um, you know, you, you've got to consider also that um, Xenon was just out, it was doing extremely well in the charts, certainly the Mega charts, and the ST charts, not so much because it was called Kelly X because that was a pirate version that actually was out before uh, the uh, proper version. But we were still, be our fame, you know, we were just becoming famous, so we go in there and um, in, in, in the meeting, the um, I don't know what he would have been at then. He would have been the probably development director or something like that. And we walk in with this game's design and, and lots of pictures and all the history. And there's probably, you know, a good week's worth of research by three of us. And we walked in the room and the first thing they said, we've changed their minds. Well, as you can imagine, that deflated us big time. You know, you can't do this to us. Well, we have. So we went, well, let's put this way, we stuck two things up there, and we walked up and went down the pub. So while we're in the pub, you know, having a few beers, thinking, you know, what we're going to do, you know, we've been promised this work, this work hasn't come up. And we thought, well, let's not waste the research we've done, let's make a game, but not real tennis, because actually real tennis is really boring. <laughs> so we, um, we were literally um, having a beer and I think um, the, the, the real tennis spec was left in the bin on the way to the pub, <laughs> just thrown away. So we thought, well, let better write something down. And all we had was a packet of silk cup. And so we opened that up and wrote on the back of the packet. And that's literally where, and that's, where, and when we went into the publisher, which, um, which we eventually sold it to, was um, uh, Mirasoft. Um, we virtually gave them this piece of paper and then told them all about it. We thought, we're not going to write every, anything down anymore because we just get a publisher going, we're not interested anymore. And that's how it happened. I mean, that's an incredible story. Um, I've spoken to a few game developers in the past and some of them would argue that a lot of game design actually takes place in the pub itself. Uh, would you actually agree with that? In the olden days, yeah, definitely. <laughs> It was over that, or it was down the arcades. We spent a lot of time in the arcades at the time, uh, playing different games. Please don't ask which ones, because I can't remember. That was too far a long ago. Um, but it, you know, the industry in those days was a little bit more casual than what it is now. But you've also got to remember, so was the money. Um, uh, I mean, Xenon uh, cost us. Um, well, we got an advance of twenty-five thousand pounds, and we made a profit on that. Well, nowadays, even in a small development house, that wouldn't last a day. You know, I mean, a large development house probably lasts in a few seconds. So, and, you know, 
when there are more money involved, I mean, the games are a lot bigger as well. Let's get into it. Some of the games are a lot bigger nowadays. Um, you know, you do have to do, you know, proper designs and stuff like that. Well, I mean, that's a really impressive journey from going from a simple idea on a fag packet to, I mean, arguably one of the best Amiga games out there. I mean, uh, Speedball 1 and 2 had uh, an incredible art aesthetic. You had this beautiful, kind of like um, futuristic, violent sport. Uh, were there any particular influences that, that where these ideas came from at all? Oh, to give our secrets away would be a bit of a shame, wouldn't it? But actually, Rollerball, <laughs> the film, I mean, but let's say, it, it's actually really funny because a lot of people said, oh, your influences come from Rollerball and stuff like that. Actually, I don't think we even saw the film before we started. Um, we saw the film probably a little bit later on. And I think it did influence it a little bit, but it's all this, um, you know, it, it's strange because what we wanted to do was to, was to, we didn't want to write a football game, we didn't want to write a rugby game or, or anything with, with traditional rules. Um, we, wanted, we just wanted to make virtually the game with virtually no rules and just fear, fast and furious. Um, and, and that's, I think, at that point you think, well this has to be a game in the future and then of course that's when the style comes in and stuff like that. But to be quite honest, yeah there was probably a little bit of influence on the film but not that much. So, I mean, there was no intention to put motorbikes in it or anything like that at all. <laughs> so, I mean, um, I mean, some of the other incredible Amiga titles that I can think of, I mean, a personal favourite of mine is the Chaos Engine. Um, I, mean, where, I mean, where did this kind of steampunk idea come, uh, come from? Because, I mean, it wasn't as, arguably it wasn't as mainstream as, as, say, it is today. There's a big following of that kind of, that, that kind of setting on the internet. I mean, where did all that come from? Oh, now I've got to remember. <laughs> um, it's a, it is actually a very interesting one because this is something that's come up over the last couple of years um, for, for me with various people asking. And I'm not really quite sure. Um, I, I do remember uh, we had a games designer with us who, um, who actually did the original design for Cats Engine. Uh, and he was reading a book called um, the Chaos. Was it the Chaos Engine or the Chaos Theory or something like that, which was supposed to be steampunk type thing. But really, I think you know the graphics and where the steampunk graphics comes from was literally from Dan Malone, who was the artist on the project. And he came up with all the graphics for that game, and he, I just think he, he just almost in himself has invented that style. Um, and of course, it was obviously a style because uh, actually he worked on uh, he was the main artist on Speedball Two, um, and so I think also that, that there's a little bit of a follow-on from Speedball Two at, into the Chaos Engine with the graphics to a certain extent, um, but. You know, what is steampunk? I don't really know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the uh, the game did incredibly well on the Amiga, very well received, and then it moved on to, I mean, a couple of co um, a couple of console ports, didn't it? I believe it went to the SNES and the Mega Drive. Um, there was something I was always curious about, in particular, one little thing in the Chaos Engine. Um, there's a character called the Preacher, and his bio says uh, he, 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 his perverse nature is not to be trusted. Uh, did that get you into any sort of trouble back in the day, or was that just kind of overlooked? Or <laughs> gee, I haven't really asked this question at all. This is going to be real hard to answer. And and actually, it does bring back memories where um, there was a debate in the office whether to have the preacher in there or not. Um, it was. I, I don't think we had anybody working in the office that was particularly religious at the time. Um, and but there was I know the conversation went on for quite a few days, and it was decided, you know, that in our eyes that you know a game is a game. It's not real life. Um, you know, it's steampunk era, which is which there is no realism to that at all in some respects. And I think this is a lot like computer games. My personal opinion is that at the moment that um, there's a lot of games coming out that are too too realistic 
they're all they're almost becoming simulations, and and a certain part of them are extremely violent in that in that respect. Where a computer game really, when we first started computer games, it was like doing cartoons, you know. And with cartoons, it's to do with comedy and it's to do with violence, but but not not violence and killing people. It's like you know, it's like cartoons, Tom and Jerry. You know, Jerry gets run over by a steamroller who becomes flat. He's not dead because he pops up and starts again. You know, so. I think that was the same thing, with, the same sort of theory with the preacher is we're putting him in because it, you know the graphics is good and it's he's, he's good in the storyline, um, you know. And if anyone doesn't like it, well, tough. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to hear that because obviously you know there, there are a lot more controversial topics in terms of the content that are put in video games these days. Um, I, I know for a matter of fact, I think the only the only out. Um, Kind of fallout from that was that his name had to be changed on the SNES port. I think he had to be changed to scientist due to Nintendo's like anti-religion. Uh, they were big on um, removing any sort of religious items or images from their particular games. Do you remember anything about that at all? Yeah, that's how I go. That comes back to me. I can't remember if it was Nintendo, but actually um, it was the American publishers. Um, Chaos Engine. Um, uh, Chaos Engine won Best Adventure Game, yeah, Best Adventure Game um, in America. Um, I can't remember the year, the year it was released. Um, and it was it was actually called um, it was called Soldiers of Fortune in America. They wouldn't call it Chaos Engine. Um, it's the same with the preacher. They didn't like the preacher. It was but it, but it changed to the scientist, uh, which is quite funny actually because I think the preacher and the scientist probably isn't much different. But um, you know. I have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, from that success, you then uh, took a few years out. Of, I think there was about a three-year gap um, before the uh, the long-awaited sequel, The Chaos Engine 2. Um, and from what I remember, it was it was actually well praised by critics, but the gameplay was dramatically different from the original. It had this more kind of one-on-one -on -one competitive aspect rather than being a co-op shooter. Uh, I mean, what was the main decision to go down that route? It was actually, it was actually Spy versus Spy in some respects. Um, and I think that... Um, I, I, I don't know... I don't really know what the reason was to switch, you know, from a cooperative game to, you know, one versus one. Um, but what what... What we've always tried to do, not in all our games, but in most of the games, um, is to actually always put a two-player element into there. Uh, you know, the Speedball, which is a great... In fact, Speedball 2 and, and Speedball 1 is a far better two-player game than it's a single-player game, in, in some respects. You know, it's certainly more competitive. Um, and, um, you know, with the Chaos Engine, I think possibly at the time that I think we want we wrote games that we wanted to play, um, and we our philosophy was if we want to play this game, the public will want to play this game, um, and and that led a lot of the a lot of the decisions, and and I think that it's also you, you know you sometimes get a lot of journalists say why don't you write a game like this, and well no because we don't think it's going to work. And, you know, we want to, we want to write a game that we really believe in. And I think that's why our games are actually so good. Um, so there must have been a decision there at some time that you know we wanted to play a spy, a spy type game. Um, I think the reason for that was as well. Actually, now it's coming back to me as well. Is that um, it was about the time that we were considering um, real multiplayer games when you were actually weren't playing on the same machine but playing on two separate machines because uh, um, the internet was. Not there, uh, but it was at its early stages. Um, that, you know, there was. God, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling really old now. <laughs> um, so you know, I think that was probably the lot more decision was because when we went to Z, uh, which was, which was the next item after the um, Ascent Two, uh, I mean, we changed formats to the PC, and we wanted to make it one of the best multiplayer games that was available. I mean, yeah, I, I, it was incredibly well praised and it was definitely uh, a different group, but I'm glad it worked out in the end. I mean, I just want to take you off uh, um, on a side question. 
you kind of mentioned that you, you'd like to make you'd like to make the games that you wanted to make. Um, understandably, now with a lot of modern game design, there's a lot of red tape involved. Uh, I've read some really disturbing stories where publishers have forced developers to change certain amounts of their content, uh, for example, like ethnicity of characters, that kind of thing, because they know it won't sell in X country or Y country. Um, do you think this will eventually be detrimental in a big way to the gaming industry? Oh, this sounds very political, doesn't it? Okay. Um, the Big Mac Brothers never took any notes of publishers at all. Um, we were, to be quite honest, very arrogant. Um, we thought, and probably, probably rightly so, that we knew better than, than publishers. Um, I mean, Zed took on something like four or five years, and, and it was four or five years late. It should have only been six months. Uh, and, you know, in that time, um, well, we actually became our own publisher, so we told ourselves what we were going to do. Um, but before that, we certainly with the Chaos Engine and with Cadillac. In fact, all the other products, we, we had a lot of pressure from publishers to finish the game to get it out. Because obviously, you know, publishers are really in there um, uh, to, to, to turn product product around and to make, you know, profits. But really, um, we, we wouldn't let them do that. We would only release the game when we were actually thought that it was actually ready. And we proved them right. I mean, certainly the people too, they wanted it out before Christmas, it wasn't ready. And we said, actually, there is a January market. And, um, you know, that people can forget that, you know, people have money after Christmas, but they're given, you know, especially kids, and they want to spend it. And so, it, it's funny with people too, we actually opened, we actually opened the publishers' minds, because after people, you know, people too did really well, when it came in at number one, and, it, and beat everything else that was out there before Christmas and actually made more money than most things over Christmas um, for the publisher the, the, the publishers took note and they now they did split or did then they start to split their releases um, and I'm not answering the question at all I can't even remember what it was <laughs> oh, it's about design and publishers uh, well to be quite fair um, you know uh, there are a role for publishers uh, in, in this age uh, they're, you know, they're good at marketing. Um, they're, they're, and another thing that some publishers are good at is actually, yeah, um, what would you call it? Um, it's not workshops. Uh, seeing what the market is, you know, whether something's going to be sold. A focus testing. Uh, it's quite interesting, I don't know if this is true, but I was told that EA, when they came out with, um, I think it was um, SimCity, no. Yeah, The Sims. Um, that the, they'd actually got the got the uh, developer to actually produce the game, how they actually wanted it, um, and then spent money on the market on the market research and focus groups, and found that they'd actually targeted completely the wrong market. Um, it didn't actually change the game, but it changed all their marketing plans, and they, the demographic actually came down for oh, 20 years or something like that. Although originally they were targeting you know a much higher range. So there is that, but I think that also is that you're also, you know, it's like books nowadays and certain, certain sort of films, you know, especially for America, um, where it's almost there's a pattern, you know, that a book has to have, you know, start with this and they have this in the middle and have this at the end, and and that's what I think a lot of them, certainly a lot of American publishers are trying to do. Um, I mean, it was not not many years ago, probably about 10 years ago, when we were told that um, the game couldn't be longer than six hours. Um, well, personally I feel if I'm buying a game and paying about 50 quid and I'm only getting six hours of play, it's a little bit of a rip off. You know, and to be told to actually do that, well, we didn't do it. And, um, it's full stop, you know, it was 40 or 50 hours or nothing, you know. Um, and I think we're still seeing a lot of this is that, you know, Certainly, with some of the franchises that have come out, I mean, I think some of the franchises are really, really good, but it's but it's it's almost a pattern now that they, you know they, that they're getting to fill in, and it's and that's all to do all to do with making money, you know. That's not about gameplay and giving the public what they really need and want. You probably can never get another job as in the publishers now. <laughs> I mean that's quite refreshing to hear the fact that you um, you know you didn't really 
you, you didn't really take all the cues from the publishers. You kind of you, you, you kind of made it your own. You, you know, you were kind of stubborn, and you had this great kind of uh, this great kind of image as well with the Bitmap Brothers. There was kind of this uh, rock star vibe going about, wasn't it? I mean, how did all this kind of was this something that organically grew, or did you just decide to do it for a laugh and then it just happened to go spawn from that? Or no, we did it on purpose, full stop from the beginning. Uh, one of one of the other um, one of the other um, things about you know we we write games that people want to play because we want to play them um, and and to be the best you know and, and to make sure a game has all the elements graphics music um, technology um, sound effects the whole lot you know uh, as a bundle but the other thing is is like we did want to what was happening. Ocean were here yesterday, weren't they? <laughs> and it sounds like a lot of people wanted to buy Ocean games and not and not who actually wrote them. I'm sorry for not sitting Ocean if anyone's here, but it's, it's quite a good example actually. You know, in the record industry, you don't go and buy an Apple record, you go and buy Michael Jackson or you buy, you know, the Beatles or something like that. You know, I, I don't think actually in records, but I don't think most people actually care yeah, who the publisher is. You know, I mean, there are there are certain labels that are out there that are, that are associate uh, a particular type of music to a label, um, but not the artists. You know, and when artists have actually moved around from label to label, actually some of them have done so well. Because, but it's not it's not actually because of the label. It's because the label hasn't put the money into the marketing and stuff like that. So with the Bitmap Brothers, what we did is that we we we, we came up with this. Um, this was after Zero. This, this is in, in people is that we decided that um, uh, that we wanted people to know us, uh, us as a group, not us as individuals, actually, us as a group. And we we um, we tried to promote after um, when we start to employ more people, we tried to promote all the people that were actually inside the game as well. If they wanted it, some people didn't want it to be. You know, they just wanted it to be a name on a box and that was it. Um, but there wasn't many of them. Um, so we went out and we did all our... Uh, we, well, we told the publisher this is what they're going to do. <laughs> quite honestly. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're not going to promote us, if you're not going to put this amount of money aside to, to promoting us, we're not going to sign with you. I mean, it was, it was just like that. Um, and they did, especially with Mirosoft, you know, uh, that one of the things that it did say, and, and, and in some respects they've also said they regret it, is that they made us too big. <laughs> um, but the thing is, by making us big, they were making money, because we had a multi-game you know, multi, uh, contract with them, it wasn't just for one game, so it was in their interest. So all these pictures, um, a lot of these pictures were um, were, were actually our, our, well they were all our ideas mainly. We picked the photographer, we picked the photographer that we worked with before on somebody else, something that we knew who would get the best out of us. Um, and, and it went from there. And, and a few of the other developers at the time tried to follow suit, but really we had to persuade persuade the publisher to put the money into it and a lot of the time the publishers weren't interested in putting money into promoting people and it's social excited really uh, when we started you know um, uh, the publisher renegade I mean that's one of the things that we did do we promoted the, promoted the artists as well as much as the product so I mean this rock star super group image is this something that you uh, feel that other developers should be doing in this day and age, it's very difficult. Um, I, you see, there's a big difference between now and then. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Now and then. You know, in those, in those days, you know, we were small bands, groups. You know, we were like we were like pop stars in respect, but there's only five of us maybe. You know, I mean, there was only three of us to start with, and then it, you know, gradually planned. You know, when you're working with some of these products now, um, and uh, you know. You, you, um, you've got thousands working on the product, so you can't promote all of those. But it doesn't stop you promoting the actual developer, because you know there is there is a developer behind the thousands, unless it's owned by the publisher. You know, well, if it's owned by the publisher, they're not going to promote themselves, because they've already done that. 
Um, it's, like, it's like it is more difficult, but I mean, he's still got people like Peter Molyneux that promotes himself. I mean, he, he's another one that you know he's got a budget. Uh, he's got a budget for for, for his self promotion, really. Um, and good luck to him on it as well, because you know. And there are a few American artists that do this as well, but there's not many nowadays. Uh, I mean, moving on through uh, through the catalogue of games that that, that Matt released. Um, obviously, uh, we had Zed, uh, and I had to tell a friend off the other day because he actually pronounced uh, it Z, and I had to tell him he was wrong. But um, I mean, that was your your first kind of jump into uh, the PC market, if I recall. Is that right? Or yeah, that was our first jump into the PC market, and it was a strange one. Um, we done we done some conversions of. Um, I mean. Virtually all their stuff is available on PC as well, as, as conversions, but it was their first product that we actually uh, started on the PC. And, and when you consider, I mean, one of the reasons why it took four years, um, is, is, I don't know if it's a funny one, but it's an interesting one, is that, of course, at the time that we actually started on the PC, there was only a flop of this. What's one of those? But there's a few for sale out there somewhere, and they're quite rare, actually. Um, but, you know, in those days, that's, that was a storage medium. It was a floppy disk or a hard disk, you know. Um, even the hard disks were um, probably smaller than the CD when it came out, to be quite honest. And then, so, we got, we got almost to the end of the, uh, of Zed about two, it took us about two, two and a half years, I suppose. Uh, and, of course, in that time, the CDs come out. So all of a sudden the publisher, and we did take notice of this one, to be fair, because it was a good argument. Well, now the CD's out, you've got to fill it. But the game only runs on one floppy. You know, what can we do? You know, we can't make more levels because the levels take up bytes, not gigs. Um, so this is where the storyline came in with all the FMVs. And, and, and in that time that it took, I mean, it took a lot of time to do those FMVs. We had a proper storyboard, we got, we got um, a, film, uh, um, a film script writer in, uh, and a guy to do the storyboard, to do all the, all the storyboards. Then we had to do all the modelling. And, it, and also, you might realise at the time, of course, this is when the 3D, real 3D stuff came out, and you had to buy all the software, which cost a fortune. I mean, uh, Silicon Graphics, we were about to sign a deal with Silicon Graphics for something like, it was like £100,000 or something, I mean, that's more money than we had at the time. Um, we didn't, we went down the maximum the PC route because we couldn't afford it. Um, and then we had, you know, three or four artists working on all, all the graphics and that took, you know, that amount of time. In the meantime, we just carried on... Uh, tweaking Z and changing it and probably rewriting it and I think we rewrote it probably about three times and um, well certainly lot, lots of parts of it and then of course when the, when the, when the, when the uh, FMVs were finished I, I think we just about managed to fill with this um, and then strangely enough you know on the next product they say well you don't have to fill with this half will do <laughs> and that's half the time I mean, I personally really enjoyed Zed. Um, I my first experience with it was the actual CD-ROM version and uh, the, the PS1 conversion as well. Um, I, I can't help but feel that it, the release of Zed at the time um, it kind of it was very very close to a, another uh, popular strategy game on the PC. Did you find that was um, did you find that was an issue? The lead programmer of Zed actually. Uh, was the lead poker of uh, Command and Conquer after he left us. Um, so yeah, there is an influence, but I think it's the wrong way round that people don't realise. Um, uh, and I think that was that's another political problem is that we actually, um, the American version was signed with Virgin, who actually was the owners of Command and Conquer. Um, and we didn't do quite so well in America, and they kept delaying the release for some reason. Um, and we had to make it easier, and it was a nightmare dealing with the Americans on Zed. Um, but of course, all in that time, I mean, you know, it, it was, yeah, it was the number one seller in, in the rest of Europe. And, um, and and when it came out in Europe, I think we came out before Command and Conquer as well. So, yeah, there is influence, but it's a wrong way around. <laughs> um, I mean. 
we, I'll just do one more question and then we'll probably uh, open it up to the audience here. I just wanted to kind of uh, throw a hypothetical your way. Um, obviously, you've, you've, uh, you, you've had some other projects in, in the later years. You, you, you did uh, Tower Games, I believe, for Tower Studios. Um, if you had the chance now, let's just say there's no issue with the money, that kind of thing, you can get any team you want to assemble together. Um, out of your classic franchises and your classic games, if you had the opportunity to give one like a AAA reboot, which one would you do and why? Difficult question. Um, right. Speedball one, I've done it quite a few times since, and it's not as good as the original, um, and I don't think it ever will be. Uh, Gods, well, sorry, but Sony beat me. Um, Gods of War's come out with three different versions, and probably exactly. Um, uh, probably exactly how I would have done it. Strange is that uh, the lead program on that is a, is a very good friend of mine, <laughs> uh, and he was quite close to the Bitmap Brothers. He, he never worked for us, but he was actually quite close to us. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's any room for it. I think that's a pure coincidence. Um, the it, I don't know actually. I think probably Z because I think. It's extremely funny. Uh, it's it's about war, but it's it's funny. It's not. It, I don't know what what, what what synergy it comes under, but it's um, but that was fun to do. Uh, possibly Cadaver, actually. Maybe Cadaver, a big adventure. If I, you know, if I didn't have the choice, or maybe something more simple, um, and just where I need a small team and we can just have. You know, lots of money and lots of fun and maybe produce something but if you did that it would be fantastic yeah hard one right okay now uh, we're going to use this opportunity to uh, open it up to the audience here uh, if you'd like to if anyone's got a question here for Mike who'd like to put your hands up uh, this gentleman right in front of me here yeah have we have we got much length on the mic or if you tell me the question for the benefit of the recording I'll just say it on the mic as well so uh, the, the question was, um, of all the, the current ideas around now in the games industry, which which current idea do you feel oh, I wish I'd thought of that? that, that. <laughs> Anything that's made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be totally honest about this. Uh, um, and sadly, as a bit like brothers, we haven't made that much money because every time we produce something, the publisher's gone broke and we never got paid. So, um, I don't know, there's, there's lots of. I don't know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, really. I haven't thought about it. Actually, I, I, suppose, I suppose it comes down to actually what games have I played over the last couple of years and what I've really enjoyed. And thinking, yeah. And actually, um, I can't remember his name. Oh, oh Skyrim. Yeah, Skyrim. Skyrim. I think, I, I personally think that Skyrim was a fantastic game. Uh, I've clocked up something like 900 hours. Um, I've got RSI from it. Um, I haven't played a game since because. Um, with programming and, and using a keyboard, I've, I've been told by the doctors not to play games. Um, so yeah, I think that one, I mean, the music is fantastic. And the, the only problem is that we're, that's really annoying is, and, the, and, the, and the, when I meet the managing director, and, when I, and I do know him, when I eventually see him, I'm going to tell him what I think about it, and it's the amount of bugs that in it, which just means that you couldn't actually finish it, um, which is a real shame, so I put so much effort into something that I was never going to win in the first place, so why bother? Anybody else? Questions, please? Yes, you, yes, sir. Um, you said uh, Bitmap Brothers was three of you in the beginning. Who were they and what were their roles? And how did you all gel together? And so, how much uh, fun was it? So there were three members of Bitmap Brothers. Who were they and how did you all come together? Yeah, I, I worked for a company called Lizard Genius and Virgin before um, I started with Bitmap Brothers. 
It was mainly at Leisure Genius when we were working on, uh, I was working on Scrabble. I did all the Scrabble versions apart from the Spectrum version, which Steve Kelly did. He's one of the part uh, partners, of the, or was one of the partners of the Big Mac Brothers. And I did all the versions of Monopoly, uh, the first Monopolies, and Eric did a few of the graphics on that. So when we started, um, oh, and then we did another another project together before the Pitback Brothers, and it was called uh, Triangle. Sorry. Um, Triangle Karate. And we all did a bit on that. Uh, so we, and then we used to go down the arcades a lot, and that's how it started. We, we were brothers. We were brothers. The name Bitmap Brothers comes from. Um, we, uh, it's very hard to think of a name for a company, and, and it's, it's worse nowadays because you've got to look at the internet. Because most it doesn't matter what obscure name you come up with, somebody's already thought about it. And they've got a WW on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then it's actually finding something. We wanted a name that was catchy. Uh, and you know, not so much catchy, but put something people would remember, uh, and and something to do with what we do, you know. So um, the because it made it sound posh, but we weren't posh. Uh, the bitmap is because it was bitmap graphics, and brothers is because we were like cooperative. We were, we were brothers in arms, if we like, so, we like that. um, so that's what that's where that came from. Um, and then so it was, um, it was me. Uh, doing all the low-level uh, programming, uh, all the sprite routines, all the sound engines, all the engines to a certain extent. Steve was doing a bit of the game, he was running on the gameplay, this is the very beginning, and Eric was doing the graphics and the design. Uh, as it goes on, I've I, I become, even though I've programmed virtually every, there's my code in virtually every game that we've actually written somewhere, I mean, it's just a little bit, but I became it was sort of doing the management side because I was the next manager before that type of thing. Uh, and then uh, when it got to uh, Steel Soldiers, I was doing the design and everything. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask as well was it true that the, the company name, the Bitmap Brothers, was that hastily put together at the last minute? Because uh, uh, you had, had to come up with a company name for a contract? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I think so. It does ring a bell. I know, I know it took us weeks. I think we, I think it was actually one of those things that you, we'd actually thought weeks and weeks and weeks about it. And I, I was telling Sammy today is that it, it was um, uh, it's so hard to come up with a name. And actually, when Eric um, came up with it and told us, me and Steve both <laughs> said them, that's yeah, uh, not very good. And um, but the next morning when we woke up we, and it was still in our minds, we said actually it's really brilliant because we haven't forgotten it. Uh, and yes, it probably, I think it was hasty. I think we had about three days left or something like that. Uh, any more questions for Mike Montgomery? Yes, you at the back there. Yeah, go on. So, do you feel with the modern uh, the modern ways to produce games now, especially for iOS and Android, it's much more of a kind of indie scene? Do you feel that developers now have a chance to once again do what you guys did back in the day? Have you done an iOS game? <laughs> have you done an iOS game? <laughs> People think that it's easy. It's not that easy. Um, most. If you think about it, most of the good games that are coming out of the iOS are actually, large teams are actually working on it. Um, it, it is actually easy for, for two or three people to actually do it. But you're competing in a market, you've got to remember that to a certain extent, that yeah, I mean I think the platform did start as an indie, as an indie platform, but of course then the big boys who got all their accountants and realised actually there's money in this. Um, so all of a sudden the indie guys have got to compete. With you know, with, with, with all the console man, in fact, uh, not console, but all the console developers that are around who have got the who have got the who have got the money, who have got the staff to actually get to do a good job, um, and it's a real shame. But it's I'm not don't don't let me put anyone off. All I'm saying is, if you've got a good idea and you, and you can put it together, just give it a go because it, because actually it's one of the only platforms uh, as the iOS and the Android. It's, um, it's really one of the only platforms around that you can actually, you know, not cost you a lot of money to put something on it. Um, there isn't, 
you haven't got the constraints of, of you know Sony and, and Xbox saying it has to be this standard and it has to have this and not this and not that. You can virtually do what you want. Um, I mean the uh, <laughs> I mean the Android is you know, I don't think there there is they've started to bring in approvals, but it's mainly how you're using the hardware and to make sure that you're not crashing the mach you know the, the phones and stuff like that and and. With um, Apple, it's just a little bit. There's a little bit more red tape, but there's not that much. And um, you know, from um, from a finished game, what you think is a finished game, because I tell you what, once they get hold of it, they're going to find hardware stuff that you haven't even thought of. Um, you know, there's very few games that get out, for, you know, on the first go. But at least you've got the, you know, the, they've got the, the, they've got that in, that barrier, if you like, to stop you putting the stuff out that's going to make a mess. Because actually. If, 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 if you produce a game that makes a mess of the machine, they're going to go back to the, the phone manufacturers, but they're also they won't buy one of your games again. You know, so, so it is a good thing. But yeah, it's just that you know it's become a big boys market as well. I'm afraid. Uh, any more final questions for Mike? Anybody? <laughs> Last chance. Yes, you, sir. Uh, what do you do now, currently? I work for another developer programming. You couldn't get away. No, I tried. <laughs> God, I've tried over the years. Um, I shut the Bitmap Brothers down as a company, uh, apart from myself, and, um, and now I only put out my, my stuff for, for iOS using other people. Um, I, 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 and I do help out on that. Uh, I start, then I, this, this is actually one question you asked before, and I didn't answer. So, yeah, so what, what happened was um, when I decided that um, I couldn't afford it actually with Bitmap Brothers because it, we were independent, and I, it was coming out of my pocket, and I, my pocket was empty, <laughs> literally. Um, so then I started a company with John Hare Jobs, who's a sensible soccer, uh, and one of my uh, guys that worked for me called Tao Studios. And we did mobile games for two years, and that was that was pretty good. But you know, that was it wasn't brilliant money for us, but we made a little. We, let's put it this way: we survived, you know. And then all of a sudden, some of the publishers were going, "Well, actually, we don't give you all um, advances anymore. You have to pay," you know. And we went, "No, it don't work that way. <laughs> we're not we're not developing the game, and we're going to have to pay you some money, you know." So we stopped that. Uh, then I did contract programming uh, for uh, about two years, I think, which I really enjoyed because I had no responsibilities. I wasn't a manager; I was just a just a programmer. Um, probably too good because they kept coming back and asking for more. Um, and then I started another company, um, working on the Wii and using motion. Um, green screen, all our backgrounds were actually shot using film um, and it, um, that was on the Wii using the Wii controller and we did keep fit games uh, we were one of the leaders leaders in that technology uh, from there we went on, we did My Coach which was with Adidas which um, was quite, which is quite funny because we did so much filming of all the stars we did Jennifer Ellis um, oh, I, there was loads of them. I think there was uh, 20, 20 odd stars we filmed all over the country. Uh, one week we were in Australia, and the next week we were, we were in America, we were in New Zealand. Uh, we were we had, we had this big big um, mat that we had to film on, but because it had to be the same for every star, we were carrying this on the planes, and, and it was like you could hardly lift it. It cost us a fortune in excess luggage, um, and then to. to <laughs> Got it all. Our insurance company decided we were a film company. Yeah, the insurance went up ten times. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was just ludicrous, you know. But we're a games company, but we spend so much. We, our budget, most of our budget, was actually going on filming. So yeah, we sort of almost on the film budget. And then we started doing hang. Um, we, we, we did um, that was using that was the Xbox and the PlayStation. So we were picking up the controllers for the movements. We, we could do, I'm sorry I'm being big at it, but we could do things that a lot of other companies couldn't do, like we would detect press-ups, very hard to detect press-ups on the on, on, on Connect. Uh, and then we just finished, before we shut down, we just finished um, with um, um, Intel, 
until I've got a new camera out, um, and so we wrote a RTS where you play the RTS with your hands, you don't press any keys or any mouse for the whole game, and that was quite a feat. I mean, we're, our technology was actually better than Intel's, um, but we ran out of money. <laughs> Um, and now I'm just deciding I don't want to run a company any longer, so I'm, I'm taking a break. <laughs> uh, I'm just doing contract programming again. Which I actually, I, I mean, it, <laughs> I, I, programming is my second career. Management was my first career. Programming was my first, second career. But like I said to Sandy, when you're doing something that you really enjoy and it's a hobby and getting paid for it, it's so relaxing, you know. At least, you know, at least at the moment I can pay the mortgage and not pay my staff instead. Um, and it's really good fun, you know, I'm working on racing games at the moment. Which, funny enough, is when I, when I first got into the industry, I did a game called Scale Electrics, which I don't think you'll find my name on it because I hated it. Um, I actually managed to persuade the, the company um, to actually get other programmers on it because I, I really did not like this this game, it was a racing game. Uh, it ended up that uh, the two programmers they put on it, um, we had to fire them because they were no good and I had to rewrite it and finish it in like three weeks or something like that. And I said, I'll never write a racing game again. <laughs> Since then, I've done SPK, you know, motorbike racing, I've done uh, Ford, uh, did Ford racing for Empire, and now I'm working on a racing game now to be announced. So, I don't know why. <laughs> um, is there? I think we've got time for just one more. If anybody else, any takers, please. Right. Uh, yes, you there. Uh, of all the games that you created, which one would you like most like to be remembered for? All of them, <laughs> <laughs> apart from Scarlet <laughs> Um I'm proud of every single one. It's fucking Scarlet Tricks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, don't go. It was, it was on the spectrum. Um, don't go and buy it. Don't go and look for it. <laughs> but um, I'm positive my name's not on it. But actually, it was all mine. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, no, apart from that, I don't. You know, it's really difficult because there's a di when you're actually producing a game, or, you know, you, I can be producing a game, I can be actually writing a game, I can be actually designing a game. But, Apart from graphics, you know, as far as graphics goes, when they come, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about um, when you actually prototype a game that you have programmers graphics in there. When I prototype games, there isn't that in there as well because I can't even draw a dot, you know, and even the stick man doesn't come out like stick man. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm crap at the graphics. I know what looks good, what should be good, you know, but but when you're involved in all this, you know, to say. You know, Cannibal is the game that I most enjoyed to actually program. Uh, uh, um, still, still Soldiers is the one that I actually put on the maximum amount of design and really enjoyed doing it. Uh, uh, Zed is the, I, I did the rewrite of the last version. Um, uh, so it, it just, all of them, by one. <laughs> Well, uh, one more? Just yeah, one, just, just one. Um, I'm not sure if it was, but I kind of remember Xenon 2 having been like the first game I ever played that had a, uh, a soundtrack like, by somebody like Bomb the Bass. Um, I don't know if it was the first to have a popular uh, like a chart track in it, but how did that happen? Um, don't say you don't know. No, <laughs> I, 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 That'd be a downer. I, I, to tell the truth, I'm not sure exactly how we got there, right. but we got involved with Riverfin Records, um, who, are, who eventually, uh, when we owned the publisher called Renegade, Riverfin Records was half, was half, owned half of it, and the Big Mac Brothers owned the other half. Right. Um, so we got we got really friendly uh, with the managing director uh, and the finance director, um, and we, because we were looking for music, you know, we, we, we wanted to put. You know, we wanted to actually be almost, you know, we're pop stars, let's get pop stars to, yeah. you know, get their stuff in our games. Um, and at the time, licensing, I mean, the whole games industry at that time was, was a, I wouldn't say it was a mess, legally it was a nightmare, yeah? Uh, we, had, we could not get a loan to do, to do Xenon. Um, the, the, 
the, the banks didn't understand the games industry. Uh, eventually we got a bank to say, yes, we'll give you the loan if you can get a contract. We got a contract, they sent it to the lawyers, the lawyers sent it back and said, you can't have a loan. But you, but you said you could, and they said we can't. We don't understand the contract. We don't understand what a game is. We don't understand, and to, to, even to this day, that is still partly true, certainly within the banking industry. Um, that, in fact, Barclays, because of it, Barclays did actually set up a particular group just dealing with the games industry, like they've done with the, you know, with, um, the film industry type thing. You go into a normal bank, you won't get loan for a game, I can assure you. And probably, if you're working in the games industry and you wanted a loan draft, they probably wouldn't give you one because they wouldn't understand what you do. Um, not quite true, but you know, it's like that. Um, and what was the question? <laughs> so, so basically, there was a, there was a, a company thing. So uh, oh, the right, record label for Bomb the Base so was the, half phone. So when the yeah Bomb the Base, we managed to uh, talk. To, um, I did, but uh, Eric did, uh, and one of the other designers managed to speak to um, uh, uh, Bomb the Base. They went out to quite a few gigs. Um, you know, the Reverend King were actually holding for the artists. Yeah. Uh, and spoke to Tim Cinema and explained what it was like. And, and they just it just happened to be writing a piece of music at the time. So that actually influenced what he wrote, as, as well as you know putting it in the game, uh, and actually uh, not necessarily for the STD and the Amiga, but on the IBM, on the Roland card, um, we got involved with Roland, uh, and it, it became the first uh, 3D soundtrack to come out, or Sudi 3 3D soundtrack to come out. And it was featured on BBC uh, on Tomorrow's World, and also it's it's actually available on one of the one of the Tomorrow's uh, one of the BBC soundtrack yeah. or something like that. It's Tomorrow's World. God, this is going back so many years. <laughs> Brings back so many memories that I've forgotten about. But yeah, and then from then that's when we get moved it for um, Magic Pockets. We had uh, Doom and Doom. Uh, Into the Wonderful was on I think Paris Engine, which was a just a small indie band at the time. Um, the guy, can't remember his name now. Um, I think he's, there were two brothers, one's dead and the other one's paranormal in the industry, uh, you know, music, as a DJ. Um, and, and a few others, yeah. yeah but it's, it's really, working with record companies is a pain in the ass. Mike, well. We have to wrap up, yeah. sadly. Uh, I just want to thank you uh, for coming down here today and having a little chat with us. It's been a real privilege, and I just want to thank you on behalf of myself and this wonderful audience here. Can I get a round of applause for Michael Cromwell? Thanks very much. That's all right, I suppose.